now we have to watch what we say. Mm -hmm. Maybe best we'd be silent then. <laughs> that is what happens when we know each other well. Got a lot of history. All right, so we are just at 11 o'clock, but it looks like we still have some people filing in. Um, the recording has been begun to start. Um, so I'll begin the introductions. Um, everyone who's here so far, welcome to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. Uh, this series is hosted by the UNM Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico uh, Behavioral Health Services Division. We are so glad to have everyone here today to join us. I'm Dr. Tatiana Matlis. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the UNM Forensic Psychology Postdoc Program. Um, don't forget next week we have Dr. David Thompson presenting on advanced topics in child forensic interview cases. For our talk today, please ask questions in the Q&A, not the chat box, anytime that you feel comfortable. But just know we won't get to these questions until the end. Also, we always try our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. So please forgive us ahead of time if we are unable to get to yours. For those of you who want CEs but are on a tight schedule, um, you'll have to stay for the full hour, but you do not have to stay longer than that. So sometimes we run over, but for the CEs only until noon. Um, or whatever it is in, in your time zone. Um, I'll try and let you know when the hours pass and we'll likely stay longer to address any questions. Um, all right, and for CMAs, sign in sheet in the chat now. Um, all right, and for the last five minutes, um, the link will be posted for APA CEs. Um, you have to save your certificate after you completed the survey because we don't keep copies ourselves. All right. Um, and we'll be recording this presentation and the PowerPoint will be sent in about a week from now. Um, so just keep a lookout for that. All right. And so now it's time for what we've all been waiting for today. I would like to introduce you to our speaker for today. This is Dr. Paul Frick. Uh, Dr. Paul Frick is the Roy Crumpler Memorial Chair and tenured full professor in the Department of Psychology at the Louisiana State University. He's published over 250 peer-reviewed publications, over 55 chapters and editor books, and he's the author of seven additional books and test manuals. The continuing line of research focuses on understanding the different pathways through which youth develop serious antisocial behavior and aggression and the implications of this research for assessment, treatment, and public policy. Dr. Frick has received a number of awards for his research. Most recently in 2021, he was awarded the Bob Smith Excellence in Psychological Assessment Award from the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology. He's currently and has been the editor for several journals on child and adolescent psychopathology. Dr. Frick was also my mentor during graduate school. And so I am particularly happy to be introducing him today and I'm very excited to have him here with us. Um, so on behalf of UNM, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, and thank you for participating in our series. Uh, we want you to know how grateful we are for your time and expertise today. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, that was quite a nice introduction and meaning even more coming from you. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the research I've been doing for a little over 30 years um, on trying to understand the causes of conduct disorder and what that means for treatment. Um, just a couple housekeeping things. 
I have put my um, email address, uh, my website here. Um, I do that um, because um, I'm going to go through a lot of studies very quickly. And um, I owe a lot of thanks to wonderful students like Tatiana um, and others that I've had at the University of Alabama and the University of New Orleans before I got to LSU. And I'm also going to go through the studies very quickly. But on my website, I have a PDF of every study that I talk about for those of you who want to go more in depth into the methodology um, of some of the studies. And I also have available all of the measures and scales that I've used in these studies freely available, which is why I can say at the bottom, I do not have any financial conflicts um, with this presentation. But to put a context for you know, um, how I'm going to present my research, um, conduct disorder, like most DSM diagnoses, in fact, almost all of them, says it, it gives you symptoms that is a pattern of behavior that violates the rights of others or that um, brings the individual in conflict with societal norms. But again, like most other DSM diagnoses, it doesn't tell you anything about why, about what caused the person to act that way. And research has been very good about documenting literally hundreds of risk factors, both within the child. You can see ranging from neurochemical abnormalities, personality factors, cognitive factors, an equal number of contextual factors, starting from the child's prenatal environment to their peer and, um, context to their neighborhood and family context. Um, and again, this is just a summary of the literally hundreds of risk factors that have been documented. And this has led a num many people to kind of pick their favorite risk factors, whether it's weapon, you know, the availability of weapons or living in impoverished neighborhoods or the availability of guns or problematic parenting. But it's important with these number of risk factors that if you focus on any one or two, you're not going to do a good job of explaining why um, a large number of children act in this way. Now, does this mean we have to have hundreds of theories and as an extension, hundreds of interventions uh, for kids with conduct disorder? What we have tried to do is to say, maybe there are common pathways. That is, maybe these multiple contextual and dispositional risk factors have some common effects on the developing child. This is what we mean by affecting the child's, some developmental mechanism in the child that makes them more likely to act in this way. And this is not only critically important for causal theory, but if you think about treatment, if you know a child has been exposed prenatally to toxins, as a clinician, you can't go back and change that. But if you know what that might have done to the developing child, then you can intervene um, in terms of those developmental mechanisms that may have been an influence. And this builds on one distinction that has been made literally for almost a century in juvenile justice research, but at least for half a century in uh, mental health research, a distinction between kids who start showing those serious behavior problems prior to adolescence and those who don't start showing problem behaviors until they hit adolescence, the childhood versus adolescent onset. And the reason this has been particularly put into the DSM since at least 1994 is that they have very different outcomes. The childhood onset, and these are data from a birth cohort, the Dunedin study, that followed a group of kids from the time they were born well into adulthood. I'm just going to give you the age 26 outcomes. And what you can see is when you look at convictions as adults, the childhood onset had a much higher rate than the adolescent onset. And this is particularly true when you focus on violent convictions. I'm just going to give you a couple more examples. Way more convictions for DUIs than the adolescent, but the adolescent was still higher than the kids who had no conduct problems prior to adulthood. But look at the violence against women. It accounts, uh, the childhood onset accounted for 95% of the violence against women committed by that whole birth cohort. So this distinction was very important prognostically. Um, and given that the adolescent onset was more likely to be limited to adolescence, the view was that it seemed to be an exaggeration of the normal developmental process of rebellion, of, of forming an identity, and 
it was different than normal rebellion in the sense of being more severe and impairing. And the reasons for this more severe exaggeration of the developmental process has been attributed to having deviant friends, have, not having a bond with pro-social institutions, not being well supervised by parents, or just having a more rebellious personality. Now, this is all I'm going to say about the adolescent onset. I just wanted to put this into context, but it's very important to recognize that about 50% of kids with childhood onset fall into this adolescent onset group. So about half of all kids with conduct disorder fall into this group. But I wanted to focus more on those that seem to have a more enduring vulnerability that lasted from childhood well into adulthood and, as I showed you, was much more likely to be aggressive and violent over that time. And I wanted to see if there were even finer grain distinctions that could be made in terms of some common developmental processes within this childhood onset group. And I tried to blend two lines of research. In adults, there is a group of antisocial adults that are labeled as being psychopathic, focusing on their callous, um, emotional, their, their uh, interpersonal style that focuses on using others for their own gain. And I wanted to blend this with research on the development of moral emotions, the development of empathy and guilt, which developmentalists have been studying for again, well over a century in terms of its relationship to whether a child is more or less likely to act in an aggressive manner. And so what I first wanted to do is, could we identify early precursors of this construct of psychopathy using indicators um, of empathy and guilt? And if you look at the four facets that have been have often defined psychopathy, um, any social facet is really the conduct disorder itself. But when we studied these other dimensions in children, we could find three similar dimensions, a callous and unemotional affective dimension, a narcissistic interpersonal dimension, and an impulsive um, dimension. Now, why have we focused on this callous and emotional dimension? One is theoretical because that is the dimension that is more highly um, related to sort of the affective components of conscience that developmentalists have been studying. But we were also interested in designating distinct subgroups within antisocial individuals. And it was the callous and emotional dimension that seemed to be best at doing that. And let me show you a couple slides to illustrate this. This was a group of adolescents who were in a maximum security facility in Alabama. And we simply grouped them into those in, that had only nonviolent offenses, those a light orange that had at least one violent offense, and then the violent sexual offenders in the dark orange that were the most violent and predatory of the group. And what this shows you is, and this should be impulsivity and narcissism, sorry, that all three groups were high on impulsivity and narcissism. So if you wanted something that would predict general antisociality, whether a child would do something to get them incarcerated in a maximum security juvenile facility, it was narcissism impulsivity. But if you wanted something that differentiated within that group, you can see it was the callous and emotional traits, which was only elevated for the predatory sexual offender group. To show you this in a child mental health, this was a child mental health clinic that I ran in Alabama in the 1990s. And the two orange groups are those that were all having either ODD or CD, so all had disruptive behavior disorder. Impulsivity and narcissism were high for all of them. You can see it was the best. If you said, what differentiate those with behavior problems from other clinic referrals? It's impulsivity and narcissism. But it was the CU traits that designated a unique group within the disruptive behavior disorders. So what this means is we wanted to expand our focus on callous and emotional traits. And so we developed ratings that took the four symptoms, and this is gonna be important because these are also the four symptoms that we'll talk about that are part of the LPE specifier in the DSM-5, and came up with 
three positively and three negatively worded items for each of those. So for the lack of guilt, we had three worded in the pro-social dimension, three items rated in the callous dimension. Same thing for the lack of empathy and guilt, three callous, uh, sorry, three pro-social, three callous. Same for caring about how well they do in work or important activities. And the same for limited emotions. And this inventory, it's available on my website if you, if you want to see it. It's been translated into 28 languages been used in over 300 published studies. There have been a number of meta-analyses showing its validity um, in you know, a wide range of samples. And we now have published a paper testing out normative empirical cutoffs using this scale. But all I've set up to this point is you can measure these traits. The obvious question is, but well, why would we want to? And so the first part is to show sort of the clinical validity of these traits. And again, not as a risk factor for general antisocial behavior, but for designating a unique group within those who are showing antisocial behavior. And I'm gonna give you just a few examples of some of the research we've done. This was one where um, all of the boys who were arrested in Louisiana for a sexual offense were sent to a single place to get evaluated. And this shows you the data from one year's worth of data collection of 150 um, boys. Um, and you can sort of see their characteristics. Um, and not only did they get the ICU, but they also got the JSOAP, a measure of their, the severity of their um, sexual offending or risk for sexual offending. And very simply, if you break within this antisocial group, those with sex offending into those high and low on CU traits, as we've done here, and you look at their scores on the JSOAP, those high on CU traits had more victims, had more degree of planning in their sexual offending, and used more violence in their sexual offending. Very importantly, and this is after controlling for a number of prior offenses. They're just general antisocial behavior. I'll show you something similar in a mental health clinic. This was a uh, community mental health center, so uh, serving uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds in the Cleveland, Ohio area. You can see we um, uh, collected the ICU on 566 collect uh, consecutive referrals. Um, and again, if you look within those with conduct disorder, those diagnosed with conduct disorder based on a semi-structured interview, those that also had callous and emotional traits were rated by their parents as more aggressive and cruel. One more example in a school-based sample. Um, we screen kids from two school systems in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, and we randomly, well, we, we stratified and randomly assigned them um, into four groups. And the two orange groups are kids who were high, rated high by their parents and teachers on oppositional and conduct problem behavior. So these are the kids with conduct problem diagnoses. But I wanna show you here is that those that were also high on callous and emotional traits showed more aggression, both reactive, aggression in response to provocation to our perceived provocation and proactive and instrumental aggression within the school-based sample. In fact, the kids with behavior problems without callous traits, they were no more proactively aggressive than the control group. I z-scored it so you can see this is the sample mean and this is whether they differed from um, the other group. So you can see that the callous kids were more aggressive and over the next four years, when you looked at their trajectory of self-reported violent offenses, it was the only group that differed from the control group, this dark blue, this trajectory over time. One last study, this is a sample that we've been working on now. I've been working with Beth Kaufman and Larry Steinberg um, called the Crossroad Sample, where we've been following over 1,200 adolescents who were arrested for the first time for a mid-range offense. And I'm gonna come back to the main part of this study in a second, 
we were interested in whether being diverted or processed in the justice system led to better or worse outcomes from the adolescents. But we followed them and assessed them every six months for three years and then yearly after that. And if you look at over four years, CU traits predicted the frequency of gun carrying in the sample over and above. Look at all of these risk factors that we controlled for impulsivity, lifetime offending, peer delinquency, peer gun ownership, parental monitoring, neighborhood dysfunction. And it still predicted frequency of gun carrying and likelihood of use in a gun during a crime over the next four years following their arrest. Very interestingly in the sample, we found that CU traits also predicted whether they would commit their crime, either the crime they were arrested for or their self-reported lifetime offending, they were more likely to commit their crimes in group and be a member of the gang or of a gang. And they often, CU traits also predicted being more likely to say, and I was the leader of that group who committed the crime, and the instigator meaning the crime was my idea. So all of this is to say, we have some evidence for some important clinical validity of these CU traits in forensic samples, in mental health samples, in school-based samples, not just in terms of severity by their offending, but also um, being more likely to lead and instigate crimes. But what does this tell you about the developmental pathway? And as an extension, what about treatment? And I'm gonna start with, this is a study that I was involved in. It was a large twin study being conducted in England, and that's not a typo. Essie Beating, Terry Moffitt, and Bob Plowman really did collect over 3,600 twin pairs, and they followed them from the time they're seven, from the time they were five years old. This study was at seven. And if you think about the, 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 the typical twin study, you look at, you compare monozygotic twins to zygotic twins, monozygotic twins being sharing 100% of the being of, the, of their genes dizygotic sharing on average 50%. And the greater concordance in the monozygotic and dizygotic twins suggest more genetic influence of that trait. And when people have done meta-analyses of twin studies with delinquency, conduct problems, aggression, they find about 50% of the variance due to genetics, 50% due to environment, 50-50. But what you can do when you have this many twins is you can do something called group heritability, where you can look at the genetic contributions of different groups of disordered individuals. And when you did that, and you looked at kids who were at seven years old were rated above the 90th percentile on conduct problems, so early onset conduct problems, you find that 50% of the variance in um, their conduct problems was due to genes, 50% due to environment, just what the individual differences um, analysis showed. But look what happens when you separate out those high on callous traits. Those high on callous traits, 80% of the variance in their behavior, their conduct problems was due to genetics, 20% to non-shared, very little to shared environment. Whereas only 30% of the vari uh, variation in conduct problems was due to genes in those low on callous traits. Now, I wanna make clear what this doesn't show you. Just because something has a genetic component does not mean it is unchangeable. Also, it doesn't tell you what is going on here. I put this up here because it clearly shows that there seems to be different processes going on within childhood onset kids with kind of problems, depending on whether they're high or low on CU traits but you don't inherit a gene that makes you callous and unemotional. You have a gene that gives you a temperament that makes you more likely to be that way than others. And when we did a review for Psych Bulletin back in 2014, we showed that there were three consistent findings related to CU traits. Kids with CU traits tended to show a reduced responsiveness or 
reduced emotional response to others' cues to pain and distress. They also showed abnormal responses to punishment cues. They were less sensitive to punishment cues, particularly when a reward response set was primed. And they showed less fear and anxiety, especially when you controlled for their level of conduct problems. And I'm just going to give you one example of a study. We, we measured emotional reactivity in many ways. We looked at skin conductance. We looked at heart rate, um, cortisol reactivity. But this was one just looking at attentional orienting to pictures of emotional content. Um, we took pictures from the IAPS, the International Effective Picture System, that had been normed and proved safe for kids that depicted threatening images, images of children or animals in distress, positive emotional stimuli. And just as a real quick sideline, when I was given this talk in St. John's, Newfoundland, I showed this um, slide and everybody stopped me and said, how could that be a positive emotional stimuli? That's a ugly rat that gets caught in your fishing net and they all should be slaughtered. Like, whoa, Newfies have a really big seal issue um, but for most people, that is a positive emotional stimuli. And if you want to be emotionally neutral, mushrooms. But anyway, this dot probe task simply um, looks at how quickly people orient to the location on the computer screen following an emotional picture. So you have a fixation point. Pictures flash for 250 milliseconds followed by a dot. All the child has to do is say the dot follows the top picture and the bottom picture. And you can come up with how much more quickly they recognize the dot following an emotional picture than following a control picture. So the child is, the, it's within child composite. So it controls for the child's overall response rate. It also controls for location. And what we first did this in a sample of children of college students. And we found that CU traits were not related to differences in processing positive emotions. It wasn't even strongly related to pictures of threat. It was more specific to pictures of distress. And just to show you what we found, there was an interaction between, and this, could, this was really a me more measure of conduct problems, is that if you look at kids without conduct problems, they showed a normative response. They were more facilitated to distress pictures than to non to neutral pictures. That's what you expect. But what this shows you here is that within kids with conduct problems, if they were high on CU traits, they were less facilitated, oops. And if they were high on conduct problems, they were more facilitated. Now, those of you out there would say, but that's an interaction of multiple regression, they won't replicate. Well, we replicated this in a group of detained adolescents. Now, those out there will all say, but you're making a person-centered interpretation for multiple regression. Let me show you, these are some findings from S.E. Veeding, who looked at brain response, particularly in the right amygdala, um, in boys with conduct problems, and they compared the amygdala response in response to fear and distress faces compared to the amygdala response to calm faces. And what I want to show you is here are the boys without kind of problems. The boys with kind of problems and high on callous traits showed reduced amygdala response. Whereas boys with kind of problems without CU traits or without CU traits showed an enhanced response. Now look how important this is. If we said, look, we're just going to study the amygdala response and its relationship to conduct problems, therefore collapsing these two groups of boys with conduct problems, we'd say emotional reactivity has nothing to do with conduct problems because this would wash each other out. And this is quite likely why we have found very inconsistent genetic findings, neurochemical findings, functional brain imaging findings, because most studies have not done this. And all of those things, the neurochemical, the brain imaging, underlie this differences in emotional reactivity. Now, what does this mean developmentally? So this 
low fearness list, this lack of fear, this lack of sensitivity to punishment, has long been related to a temperament related to a less lessened or underreactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Developmentalists have spotted this as early as six weeks of age and has called it variously the fearless or low behavioral, in, 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 low behavioral inhibition. And they have studied and shown that this can relate to problems developing empathy in guilt for a number of reasons. The most common explanation is the way a child learns to take others' perspective is when they do something to cause a child to cry, that cry is aversive. And even before they can take their perspective, they say, oh, that's not pleasant. I don't like that child crying. And it motivates them to find out what caused the child to cry, which was their action. And so the lack of this pro-social emotion lessens the motivation of the, the natural motivation of the child to take others' perspective. It also makes the child more difficult to socialize since they don't respond to punishment and they tend to ignore the effects of their harmful behavior on others because they're focusing on their outcome. So we feel like the developmental mechanism here is a deficit in the affective components of conscience or a deficit in pro-social emotions that can lead to this especially severe pattern of antisocial behavior, which includes instrumental regression. Now, the importance of doing such a developmental trajectory model is to say, once we know that, we can start looking to see how we can deflect kids off of this trajectory. And I'm not gonna go through a lot of what we did there, but another reason to do this is to say, okay, if we identify kids who are following this trajectory, does that give, or, give us a clearer picture of other kids who show childhood onset kind of problems. Now, remember, I already said adolescent onset accounts for about 50% of kids with kind of disorder. This limited pro-social emotions or callous, high callous and emotional traits only accounts for about 30% of those within the childhood onset group. But when you take this group out, what do you get with these other kids? Not only are they not emotionally underreactive, they actually, remember, show high rates of emotional reactivity. Not only are they not callous, but they often are highly distressed by the effects of the behavior on others. They often have high rates of anxiety disorders. And they are also very impulsive with high rates of an ADHD diagnosis. They also tend to be lower on IQ, particularly verbal IQ. These are findings from our clinic referred mental health sample showing that kids compared to kids without disruptive behavior disorders, kids with callous and emotional traits were no different in their average IQ, but the uh, kids without callous traits were almost one standard deviation below the mean. And when you look at parenting, this was a study we did with that mental health sample, but also augmented with community uh, uh, families with the same demographic uh, makeup. And we showed that if you look at the dimensions of parenting that have been most highly related to kind of problems, things like inconsistent parenting, harsh parenting, poor parental supervision, lack of positive reinforcement, lack of involvement um, in the parenting, we can show that the kids that were low on callous and emotional traits those aspects of parenting were highly related to kind of problem. That's that blue line. But look at this. The kids high on callous traits, the level of this parent, dysfunctional parenting that they showed was unrelated to their behavior problem. So what does this tell you about this non-callous group? We feel like the developmental mechanism for them is a lack of planning and forethought. They act in an aggressive and sometimes antisocial manner because they're emotionally aroused or they don't think through the consequences of the behavior. 
They feel bad about it afterwards, but they have trouble regulating it. And that lack of regulation can come from less than optimal socializing environments, low verbal IQ, or high emotional reactivity. So what I want to paint for you here is that we have tried and have designated sort of three clear developmental mechanisms leading to conduct disorder. One, that seems to be an exaggeration of adolescent uh, rebellion. And two, more enduring vulnerabilities, one related to poor conscience development and one related to problems in behavioral and emotional regulation. Now, I'm gonna talk in a second about um, but some treatment implications of this, but one of the things I wanna show with this is that, again, um, if you look at this, you say, well, this makes sense given the behavior genetic findings you showed, we have a nature versus nurture pathway. That is not true. About five years after our study, a group of Australian researchers perfectly replicated that interaction using observations of parenting, showing that hostile and coercive parenting was highly related to conduct problems, but only those low on CU traits. But what they also found was that if you separate out parental warmth, it actually was more highly related to the conduct problems of those high on CU traits. So now you're saying, well, what the heck? How can something be genetic and still be highly related to the environment? There are two possibilities. One is that you could have child effects. And in our crossroads study, when we followed, again, we started in adolescence. So this is following these adolescence from early adolescence through late adolescence into young adulthood. And we used an analysis that showed, was able to separate sort of overall between individual associations from individual changes and look at whether warmth was related to increased, lack of warmth was related to increase in callous traits or the opposite. Callous traits was more related to increases in warmth. And it was that path. Callous traits predicted decreases in warmth over time, but warmth did not predict increases in callous traits over time. The other thing that is possible is that you could have a genetic predisposition that is moderated by the environment, a gene by environment interaction. And this is illustrated, this was a study of 516 kids who were adopted away at birth. So they had no contact with their biological mother after birth. And what they showed was that at age 27 months, any social behavior in the biological mother predicted callous and emotional traits, a strong genetic effect. But what they also showed you was that warmth in the adoptive mother at 18 months, so mother's use of positive reinforcement, adoptive mother's use at 18 months, buffered that effect. Look at this. This solid line is a relationship between biological mother's antisocial behavior and child callous traits in those low on positive reinforcement. Those high on positive reinforcement a minimal and non-significant association. So the genetic risk was buffered by the, the, the adoptive mother's use of positive reinforcement. Now, the other thing, I mentioned this when I was talking about the brain imaging, but look at this again, if you were saying, I'm gonna be studying parenting in relation to conduct problems. If you didn't separate these groups, you would say, and I can give you the figure, parenting was related to 0.21 with conduct problems overall. You'd say that's significant, but modest. But look how much that underestimates the effects of parenting for the majority of kids who don't have callous and emotional traits. This could have important policy implications. So I mentioned to you that the crossroads study that we've been following that sample from the time of their first arrest into young adulthood, 
we have done several studies showing that kids who were diverted after their first arrest were much more, much less likely to reoffend than those who were placed in the system. But that was moderated by CU traits. That's what I'm gonna show you here. The top set of graphs are self-reported offending. The bottom set of graphs are official arrests. What that shows you is that in low and middle levels of CU traits, the effects of formal processing was significant. Whether you looked at self-reporting offending or arrests, there was no difference at high levels of CU traits. So what that said is our findings showing that there was a detrimental effect of formal processing of youth actually underestimated the effects of the process, the juvenile justice system for the majority of kids who were arrested. So it has important implications for not just how you conduct ideological research, but also for how you interpret policy research. But what does this mean for diagnosis and treatment? So as I mentioned, the childhood and adolescent onset has been um, recognized in the DSM since the DSM-3, no, since uh, DSM-4 in 1994. And what was needed was to recognize that there is an additional distinction that needs to be made. This is what led to the DSM-5's adoption of conduct disorder with limited pro-social emotion. And it, uh, includes symptoms that have to be shown. You have to show at least two of these symptoms persistently across multiple relationships and settings. So it can't be something that the individual only shows in a certain setting or in a certain relationship. And it is the four symptoms that also led to the development of the ICU. The lack of remorse and guilt, the callous lack of empathy, the lack of concern about performance, and shallow and deficient affect. Since, well, oh, and just to let you know, um, many of you may know this, but in 2018, the ICD-11 came out, and it also put in a specifier um, with limited prosocial emotions for their what they call conduct dissocial disorder. The main difference is they allowed its use for oppositional defiant disorder as well, but it included the four symptoms as well as a relative indifference to the probability of punishment. So what we have been doing since that time is we have been developing other measures for assessing this when you can't just rely on a rating scale measure. So we have been developing a clinician rating, um, the CAPE, where it's designed for ages three to 21. And what it does, it's clinicians rate how well a child corresponds to prototypical descriptions of each of those symptoms. And this is done by trained clinicians following semi-structured interviews done with at least two informants. I will say, um, this is available on my website. Um, and the training PowerPoints are there, you know, the training process is there, as well as the manual for this and the, the semi-structured interview. We now have only two published studies, so I wanna be very clear on that. One in a sample of detained adolescents in Spain, where 72 detained adolescents and we showed that the overall diagnosis from this was fairly reliable. The individual symptoms were much lower. And it showed some validity by showing those high on the specifier from this um, clinical interview had more antisocial behavior, but not more other problems. So showing both convergent and divergent validity. And we did another um, validation in a sample of kids in Australia referred to a mental health clinic. And again, showing that those high, or that at least the symptoms from the CAPE 
were related to conduct problem severity, antisocial behavior, and um, empathy and aggression, as you'd expect. And even in some cases, predicted over and above just using the ICU questionnaire. Now, but what does this mean for treatment? So I started with the idea that interventions need to be comprehensive because there's so many risk factors. But what our research suggests is that it also needs to be individualized. What's gonna work for a child who is acting out because they're rebelling against authority, because they're acting out um, because they can't control their emotions, that they have trouble regulating their behavior and think through, they act impulsively, is gonna be different from interventions that are used to enhance empathy in guilt. And I will say, what seems to be the case is that we have actually underestimated the effectiveness of many of our interventions. Things like mentoring for adolescents who might have adolescent onset kind of problems or the effects of anger control training and other types of impulse control training simply because we have used it with everybody and not try to tailor it to the individual needs of the child. Now, what that also means is we have not really focused on kids with callous and emotional traits. And in our psych review, we did say, show that the typical treatments typically don't work as well for those kids. We found 21 studies and in 85% of them, the level of CU traits alone or CU traits with other psychopathic traits were related to poor response to treatment. In the juvenile justice system, it, they were less likely to participate in treatment. They were more likely to recidivate after treatment, less quality of participation in treatment. In inpatient hospitalizations, they were longer stays, more restrictive physical interventions. And in an outpatient treatment, calistrate was negatively associated with nine of the 14 outcome measures for young kids with kind of problems. But there's an important caveat. I'm gonna use a study that we did to illustrate this. We studied, uh, we conducted a study of 134 adolescents who were arrested in Jefferson Parish, right outside of um, New Orleans, and referred to a community mental health treatment for functional family therapy. An evidence-based treatment that we thought could be very important for kids with callous and emotional traits for two reasons. First, they focus a lot on engaging and preventing dropout. Remember, that was one of the things that was characteristics of kids with callous and emotional traits. But they also focused on motivating the adolescent using anything and everything that could change the function of their behavior. So they could focus on motivating them in their self-interest. Now, I wanna be clear that this was an open trial, not randomly assigned. So we studied all of the kids referred, 134 consecutive referrals to the Community Mental Health Center. This is what they look like. And as you'd expect, the kids with callous and emotional traits, and let's just focus over here, had more parent-related conduct problems prior to treatment. But what we looked at here is callous and emotional traits actually predicted greater change in treatment. And callous traits was not related to dropout and participation. Remember, those are things that have been related in other studies. Also, during treatment, callous traits predicted violent recidivism, even controlling for ratings of conduct problems prior arrests. But this was reduced over time. Now, but what happened was because they started treatment worse, and even though they responded best, they still ended treatment more severe. And this is what we've been finding for all of the interventions that we've looked at. So for example, we also did some studies looking at a parenting intervention for very young kids, something called parent-child interaction therapy, very effective treatment for young kids with kind of problems. And what we showed was kids with callous and emotional traits did respond to this intervention, but they started treatment worse. And despite responding, 
still ended treatment with more severe behavior problems. So what this has led us to do is to say, we're not gonna give up on these evidence-based treatments uh, because they do work for kids with callous and emotional traits, but we're gonna try to enhance them based on what we know about these kids' characteristics. And so a student of mine, Eva Kimonis, has worked for the last decade to enhance parent-child interaction therapy by coaching parents to engage in more warm and responsive parenting. Remember, that seems to moderate the risk for callous and emotional traits, to shift their emphasis away from using punishment to use reward, and to add an emotional coaching component where parents help to teach their young child how to pay attention and recognize emotions in others, even though that doesn't come naturally to the child. And in our first uncontrolled test that we published in 20, um, 2019, of 23 families of three to six-year-old children, this enhanced parent-child interaction therapy had medium to huge effects. Now remember, this is uncontrolled, so it's simply post pre to post treatment effects, no randomized control. And these gains are maintained at three months. We have just published our first randomized control trial. This is gonna come out in behavior therapy. Um, and again, it's a small randomized control trial, but these are all kids with high callous and emotional traits. And 21 were, were randomly assigned to see, receive standard PCIT and 22, receive our enhanced PCIT. And you can see how many we followed from follow-up into the analysis stage. And I'm just gonna show you, as you'd expect from our things, the normal, the regular PCIT, the standard PCIT, which is this dotted line, it did reduce conduct problems in kids with callous and emotional traits. And in fact, at post-treatment, there were no differences than from the enhanced a PCIT. But look what happens at follow-up. The conduct problem kids that received, the conduct problem kids with calcium most traits that received the enhanced PCIT CU maintained their gains and actually sometimes continued to get better, whereas the other kids regressed on measures of problem behavior, aggression, and externalizing and even on CU traits themselves. So I know I'm almost out of time. So let me summarize what, um, what I've described here. We feel like over the past several decades, we have identified three common pathways, three pathways through which a whole host of risk factors can influence the developing child and adolescent and put them at risk for acting in an antisocial and aggressive manner, in a manner that violates the rights of others. Recognizing this is critical for studying causal factors because you can have very different causal factors across these groups. That if you don't recognize them, it's gonna, here's a technical term, muck up your results. Clinically, it's important because these groups have very different patterns of behaviors and outcomes. And they also have different responses to treatment. And again, I wanna say this very cloud and clearly, kids with callous emotional traits are not unresponsive to treatments. Even if you did no modifications to things like parent-child interaction therapy, functional family therapy, then studies with MST and other evidence-based treatments, they do respond. It's just, they start treatment worse and then they, despite improving still end treatment work. So what we have been trying to do is take these evidence-based treatments and enhance them to be even more effective for those kids now diagnosed with limited prosocial emotions. And I will stop there and let you um, ask questions, but I do want to um, thank um, the funders um, of this research over the years. Um, and I'll stop and let you ask questions. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
I know I always learn something new listening to you. So I'm, I'm sure our audience learned a lot of new things today. Um, and we have a lot of thoughtful questions. So um, first, something that, um, oh, and let me remind everyone, if, if you haven't gotten your uh, the link to the CEs in your chat, um, um, grab that now. Um, and we'll have that in there. And, till the hour and, and including when we go past. Um, Alex just posted it again for you. Um, okay, so on to some questions. Um, so somebody was wondering, in the ICU, are there any validity scales or ways to help determine if the person was providing a defensive or positive impression on the measure? Um, if so, can you provide some context for those items and how to interpret a profile in light of validity concerns? And if not, what advice can you give about how to give context to the results found on the ICU? Yes. Uh, so a couple, the ICU itself does not have validity scales. Um, but when we were first developing it, um, we gave it with other measures of social desirability um, and other validity measures. And it was not strongly correlated with um, other in, um, measures of a highly social desirable or other types of response sets. So it in and of itself is not highly related to response sets, but I know many of you are working in forensic settings. It's like, yes, but somebody could purposely um, uh, change, you know, purposely try to fabricate their responses and absolutely. And so there are a couple things that can be done. One, this is one of the reasons why we developed the tape to have a more in-depth clinical assessment in which, and you'll see from the um, interviewing technique, basically it is up to the interviewer to follow up the standard questions in any way to gauge, and you don't rely simply on the person's self-report. If you are just using the ICU, and you're using in a forensic setting, you would have to give other measures of a response set. Again, it doesn't tell you for sure that you're saying this person has a tendency to use these response sets that could have influenced the ICU, but it's not included in the ICU itself. Thank you. Um, and also regarding the ICU, somebody was wondering if anyone has done any work on item response theory analysis with the ICU um, to see whether it functions similarly across different racial or ethnic groups? Okay, um, so yes and no. So um, there has been, they have done, we have done item response theory and I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but it has not looked at similarities across racial and ethnic groups. There have been studies looking at the factor structure um, across racial and ethnic groups and showing um, uh, that it measured the construct in similar ways across um, certain countries and certain uh, language translations, as well as ethnic groups and age groups. Um, um, so I don't know of anybody who has actually looked at um, item response theory. Where we have looked at item response theory, it's kind of interesting, um, is that what we show from item response theory is that the positively worded items are much have a much lower response rate. They're people are much more likely to say, I'm very callous, than people are saying, yeah, I'm not really pro-social. And that leads to different item difficulty across the items depending on their wording. And that's become important because that really um, made interpreting some of the early factor analyses very difficult because people didn't control for item wording, which meant you sort of had subscales that were based on positively versus negatively worded items. That was really just a method variant. So there is item response theory that, but it has not looked that I know of across ethnic <clears throat> racial groups, but the factor um, uh, validity has been supported across them. And they have shown that some of the predictive validity um, is similar across. And again, it has been used um, in very um, different countries um, with very different cultures um, with similar validity findings. Thank you. All right, so um, someone else was wondering what the logic was for extending the diagnosis of conduct disorder past age 18. Um, is there some sort of qualitative difference than those with conduct disorder 
older than 18 versus younger than 18? And at what age does it stop making sense to diagnose an adult with conduct disorder? That's an excellent question. Um, and this is gonna go back to a, a little bit of the DSM process. Um, uh, the DSM really wanted to be more lifespan. And so it really wanted to get rid of all of these. Um, you can only give diagnoses, you know, before a certain age or after a certain age. They wanted, you know, you to describe age-related changes. So in general, all of, you know, we had the opposite problem, um, you know, or a similar problem with particularly ODD. What does ODD look like in adults versus kids? Now, the other thing that was used um, is that um, if you remember, conduct disorder does not require childhood conduct disorder. It just requires um, that you show a pattern of behavior with at least two symptoms, um, with at least one being within, you know, I'm trying to remember the exact time frame, but it has to be within the last year. So it could capture adults who are showing a transient level of conduct problems that would not fit with antisocial personality disorder. Now, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. you know, um, I work mostly with kids and conduct disorder is one of the most common reasons kids are referred for either mental health treatments or you know, if they are, it's the most common diagnosis if you go to juvenile detention centers because they're there for antisocial behavior. Um, I know of very few people who use it regularly in adulthood uh, because I, um, there is an a, adult only um, designation for antisocial personality disorder. Um, so I'm not sure what the diagnosis of conduct disorder in adulthood um, gains you, um, but the DSM wanted to not have what they called arbitrary age restrictions. That was unsatisfying, wasn't it? Um, okay, so um, Tatiana, um, I think Tatiana froze, right? Yes, we may have lost her. Let's just give her. 20 seconds here or so, and then we'll see if she okay. uh, runs back. Wasn't sure if it was me or Tatiana. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Everybody hold tight for a moment. Okay, Dr. Frick, I'll give you one just while uh, we see okay. if Tatiana returns. Um, <clears throat> in your research relative to indifferent socialization, have you come across any autism spectrum disorder comorbidity with conduct disorder? Ooh, very cool. Um, a very important line of research because you would think kids with calcium emotional traits, you know, kids with autism lack empathy as well, right? Well, what it seems to, to show is that um, kids with autism, they actually do not lack the affective components of empathy. That is, they become aroused to distress in others, but they have trouble with theory of mind. They can't take the perspective of other kids. It's the opposite for cat kids with callous and emotional traits. Often they do have no trouble with theory of mind. So they can take the perspective of others. They just don't want to. They don't experience the emotional arousal that motivates them to do something about that. So they both lack empathy, but one is more related to the cognitive aspects of empathy, autism, and one more related to the affective components of empathy, callous and emotional traits. Thank you. All right, am I back now? Not sure what happened there. Thank you, Alex, for jumping in. Um, 
All right. So um, someone was wondering, um, they said they, they may have heard wrong, but uh, did you state that there's no improvement in an adolescent's behavior even after receiving treatment um, such that they end up worse? Could you mind oh. clarifying that? Yes, I want to clarify that because no, and this is very, very important. Um, and again, I know that they've done this with functional family therapy with adolescents, with multi-systemic therapy with adolescents, with various types of parent management training with younger kids. And very consistently, and they've done a number of meta-analyses and reviews on this, the kids with callous and emotional traits start treatment worse. They actually do improve, sometimes improving the most with these treatments. And they improve on both their behavior and their callous traits. It's just that despite improving with treatment, they still often end treatment worse than other kids with conduct problems and not in the normative range, still in a clinical range. And so that's very important context to say they do respond to many of these treatments. It's just we need to enhance them, enhance these treatments, because we need added benefit. Thank you for clarifying that. All right, and someone was wondering, um, they were asking about transfer hearings. So when a minor is being tried as an adult um, and listed that one of the main criteria is with regard to their likelihood of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were asking if, if you believe it's reasonable to transfer some minors to adult court um, or issues that are relevant to that. And so maybe you could speak on um, the relevance of conduct problems or callous and emotional traits in that context. Yes. And um, I'll give you an example in the school system. Um, but absolutely. And that's sort of why I answered their last question with such um, passion, I guess, is that I think psychopathy and callous traits can often be used in transfer hearings to say, these kids are not treatable. And the research does not support that. They are treatable. You can reduce uh, their risk for recidivism um, by getting them involved in certain types of evidence-based treatments. Um, and to give you the analogy, I was asked when, I, when, when we, we had the precursor to the ICU, I was asked to go to the Miami school system because they wanted to use my scale of callous traits to say kids who are high are behavior problem kids and can be kicked out of school or sent to um, alternative schools. Whereas kids without callous and emotion traits would be emotionally disturbed and get treatment. So you see the callous traits was used to exclude them for treatment. And so I gave, I said, no, Again, if you look at your definition of emotional disturbance, kids whose emotions are, you know, show atypical emotional responses that influence their behavior and ability to learn. That's kids with callous and emotion traits. It's a low level of emotion, but it's still abnormal emotion that affects their behavior and they need a different type of treatment. So it's the same thing I would argue is that they are. They're, and, and if you remember, they are more likely to violent reoffend. So there is some risk for violence level with high levels of callous traits, but they are not untreatable. And so both of those things have to factor into those decisions. Thanks. All right. And I think um, we have time for one more question. Um, so Someone was wondering, since there's no compromised effect of juvenile corrections placement for high CU youth, those youth aren't necessarily harmed by close custody. So however, would your PCIT or FFT interventions be desirable instead of juvenile corrections placement, or should those be done in close custody facilities? Excellent question, uh, because that's, uh, so yes, that should, you know, what that says, and particularly for the older kids that we're talking about there, Things like functional family therapy, MST, or other evidence-based um, treatments for adolescents should be done. And where it's done really 
that is not as important for callous and emotional traits, but it's on the level of severity of their behavior. What do I mean by that? Even within CU traits, there's a wide variety, a, a, wide, a wide variation on how severe their behavior is. And so their dangerousness should be assessed. It can include CU traits, but it's also going to say include their history of violent offending, um, you know, their um, previous arrests and parole violations, other things that estimate their risk. So yes, they would get, and I would say the vast majority of kids, even kids with callous traits, are lower risk and can be maintained out of the juvenile justice system. All right. Well, thank you again, Paul. Um, I think that is all the questions we have for today. Fantastic. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you for hanging with me. Yes, thank you for coming. Um, and yes, everyone, the um, slides will be posted in about a week and um, today's talk was recorded. So that'll also be up there in our drive and on the YouTube channel. So um, you'll be able to access it there. And thank you again, Paul. Appreciate Good it. Good to see you, Tatiana.